life straight through No, it won't be a pretty sight This much I can tell you Foot to the pedal It's never fast enough I'll probably hit the wall This is how we fall in love Crash Landing I don't not understand it This is so not like I planned it But I, 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 I'm Crash Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. We have a special guest with us today. Katie Cole is here. Great to see Hi. you. Thanks great. for coming in. <laughs> no problem. It's great to be here. You made the trip up from Nashville. I sure did. This is my second time here. Uh -huh. I was here for Gear Fest um, with Yamaha and just had such a blast and just wanted to come back. <laughs> right, right. It's great. Well, we're glad to have you back here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So what are you doing here today? Um, well, I came up to do a lunch and learn with Yamaha to support um, the use of the montage and just be an, an additional musician just to show how this particular very, very intense keyboard can be used in a practical sensibility with a singer-songwriter. And, you know, it was something that was sort of the little brainchild of um, Greg Curtis when we were here at Gear Fest. He was like, well, we could take this guy and this girl and we could put them together and maybe we can do something. I just, and I was just like, I'm in, just let me know when and I'll be there. Right, yeah. right, right. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, we appreciate you coming in and oh, of course. helping to train the sales engineers on the gear and yeah. uh, showing off your musical skills at the, yeah. uh, at the same time. No, I it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, great, great. So taking a step back, it's quite a journey from Melbourne, Australia to Nashville. How did you end up making the move? Well, it took a, I mean, it was a long process, but it was one of those this never happens type stories. I was in um, in Melbourne and you know chipping away at my career. I was playing you know anywhere between five to seven gigs a week, um, but also working on um, my music as a songwriter and as an artist. And a producer I actually wanted to work with reached out to me, um, and that never happens. Sure. It's usually that you know it's like as a musician you end up just like throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, and usually nothing sticks. But when somebody reaches out to you, I mean, this particular producer is Howard Willing and he'd worked with um, Sheryl Crow and Counting Crows and Smashing Pumpkins and OK Go and had this really sort of eclectic range of artists. I read liner notes, I always have. Right. Um, and so I was like, OK, let's talk. And he said, you know, would you ever come out to Los Angeles to record? And I'm, I'm like, well, yes, now I have a reason to. So I hopped a plane and did a couple of trips back and forth to Los Angeles to record what would be my first American EP and realized within my second trip, I kind of need to be in this fair country. Right. Um, and so, you know, kind of jumped ship on Australia, which I love. I mean, Australia is my home, will always be my home. But in terms of really getting things done, when I, I mean, my first trip to Los Angeles, I was in Henson Recording Studios, you know, famous Henson. Sure. And it was like Michelle Branch was down the hall and Tracy Chapman was down the hall. And that was my first walking into a studio and Steve Gadd was drumming on this record. And it was like, huh? Like it was one of those, <laughs> all of those liner notes I'd been reading throughout my life were like, oh, these are these people and they're right here in this city. So for me, I, I worked out very quickly, okay, I need to be here. And as soon as I moved to Los Angeles and made the transition, as a songwriter, like as an artist, my artist career was, was blooming in Los Angeles, playing shows, et cetera. But as a songwriter, I started to hear more and more word of Nashville. And so I started making, you know, semi-regular um, regular trips over to Nashville for songwriting with just what I would consider to be like some of the best songwriters in the world and the attention to detail on just getting the craft of the song down and rewriting. and. That's, that's their nine to five job, writing, you know, two or three songs a day, every day, forever. Right. And it, that's somewhat exhausting. And I've done those trips where I've written three songs a day for a couple of weeks. And by the end of it, I'm like, oh. <laughs> but it's, it, you know, it's a real liberating experience to see people doing what they love and not, not letting like this little part of the song slide. Like people, people that practice every day, there's one element to being a great performer. P people that songwrite every day, there's another element to that too. So I was really fascinated with, with that. And after multiple trips thought, I kind of need to live here. Right. So, and also there's great fried chicken. And, well, of course, yeah. Uh, you know. Right, all the great Southern food. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one thing. People always, t 
asked me about Nashville and songwriting and I'm like, yeah, but there's this food. Like you, you come here and I'm, I want you to meet these songwriters and go to this venue, but this food. <laughs> <laughs> this this comes first, right, my friend. Right. That's our priorities. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. So I wouldn't really say that you're a, a country artist at all. Uh, do you find that there's a pretty open stylistic field there as far as Nashville goes? Oh, it's becoming more so. I mean, it it it's you know born and bred with country. Mm -hmm. I mean, both styles, country and western. Right. But um, it's becoming more and more eclectic with um, people like um, Jack White opening third third man records and. They're being a little bit more open, openness in the rock vein and the indie scene there is starting to really bloom as is the Americana scene. And I remember when I first started making trips over to Nashville in like 2011, the Americana Fest was something that was just starting to sort of bloom, the, the big sort of conference. And mm -hmm. I started to see more and more what I would consider to be classic country artists and blues artists falling under that umbrella. And I thought that was really fascinating and each year that particular festival has become bigger and bigger and now these artists are starting to really break through like you know Jason Isbell and um, yeah Chris Stapleton and, and the like and I mean all the people that are falling under that banner now are people like Bonnie Raitt and it's just interesting to right. see the, this is where real songs are starting to sort of slide and I've always had an interest in really great stories and I consider myself to be a storyteller so I, I've always been fascinated with the song first then the artist that mm. does the song. So for me, coming over to Nashville and being involved in that and seeing that sort of bloom, and Nashville also has a really wonderful um, independent radio station which plays you know, a dominant amount of content from local artists, which is, I find really interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm not a country artist. I'm definitely more Americana singer, songwriter, and, and that's led me to, I mean, open for bands as eclectic from Glen Campbell to America to, you know, Billy Corgan and Smashing Pumpkins and sure. being thrown into all this all this mix and also how I got involved with Yamaha was through Smashing Pumpkins and right yeah right right so you mentioned Glenn Campbell you did some singing and touring with him correct yeah I, I opened up a bunch of shows for him it was when I just moved over to Los Angeles we were in Nevada for a bunch of shows and watching him perform was I mean this was before he started to really um, delve into his Alzheimer's and you know obviously way before anything was really happening with him with his health but watching him perform and his ability as a I mean people think of him as this singer but his guitar ability and obviously his involvement with the wrecking crew and just being that session guy and he was the one that told me about like because I use a lot of capos when I write on guitar and he was telling me you know don't ever be ashamed of that that's part of you know he told me part of being in the studio was having this thing to get these really clean inversions of songs and no one else was really using them the way that he was mm -hmm. and that was what sort of set him aside, apart from his ability obviously but that was right. what was also setting him aside the fact that he could do things that other guitarists just weren't doing right um but yeah he's he was an incredible force and I, yeah i was lucky enough to sing on um his ghost on the canvas record and yeah just be involved in that that last really big record for him and yeah he's, he's he was always such a joy to be around and he always rem remembered who I was and, you know, right up until kind of the end and yeah, he was just this sweet man that, yeah, right. huge, huge star and yeah, sure. he'll never be forgotten. Right, right, right. What a great opportunity to work, yeah. to work with someone on that level. Very lucky. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Billy Corgan and, and Smashing Pumpkins. You also sang and played some bass with them, right? Yeah. Well, it was actually part of my involvement with, with Yamaha was, I, I mean, I, we had the same uh, record producer and Billy had asked me to open He said, do you want to open up a show for me at um, Ravinia Pavilion in Chicago? And I was just like, yeah, <laughs> like, you know, <don't>, right. <laughs> let me think about it. <laughs> no, you just go, yes. And then work out the details later. Um, and wildly different styles of music, obviously, but, you know, played, I think I threw it like a New Order song into the mix and then the crowd were like, oh, you're all right. Um, during my set, right. you got to win them over somehow. Sure. Um, but he obviously knew who I was and liked that. And, and then the following year, which was 2015, he said, hey, do you want to open up this tour? We're doing a sort of a semi-acoustic electro tour. And then it became, do you want to open up and play a couple of songs on bass during, the, so kind of doing double duty, I suppose. And I was just like, again, yes, and I'll work out the details later on. Um, so that happened and I ended up opening up all of those shows um, in a bunch of these cities and being uh, 
showcase to this very, very different audience that all kind of got to know, like I was playing solo when I was opening up, so people didn't so much hear the songs as being Americana or country or singer songwriter, they just heard the songs as songs, which I'm very, very grateful for because then you can interpret them however you want. Right. But I mean, these fans have come to know what I am as an artist. And when he asked me again the second time, hey, do you want to do this? We're going to do an, an even bigger tour. This is like a two and a half month tour. This was last year. And it's going to be with the original drummer, Jimmy Chamberlain, and, and with Jeff and, you know, you can play bass. And we're going to bring James um, Ehar back for a couple of shows. And it became this big sort of deal. And again, I said yes before. <laughs> going through the songs and realizing, exa- I mean, I understand his songwriting is very complex um, because I know the material, but going through and I, I'm somewhat of a bass player. I'm, I'm a guitarist. I'm a singer. I play keys. Mm-hmm. I just play a little bit of everything. Like that's my, that's my deal. And to really get in there and really learn how to play bass for this tour was a really challenging notion because there's some parts in some of those songs. And we did um, something for the Siamese Dream album, we did a Siamese Suite, which was eight songs off that particular record in a row. Um, and there's some pretty interesting songs on that. And the right. arrangements are crazy. And he sees a very challenging songwriter that a song is not a song, a chorus isn't a chorus, a verse isn't a verse. Everything has these little intricate parts, which is interesting to learn. And he was m- more impressed with bringing me back on for this tour, I think, because I'm a vocalist and having somebody really sing and really back up what he's doing. People don't realize what an extensive range he really has as a vocalist. People think, oh, he just sings with, you know, this this particular voice, but his, his voice and his range has expanded so much since, you know, back in the 90s, then he's really using it. And these are two and a half hour shows mm. and he's singing everything in the original key, everything at full volume. It's impressive to watch as a vocalist when I consider myself to be a vocalist and then watching him, I'm like, oh, okay. Right. Um, but yeah, supporting him doing that too was um, interesting and letting those fans know also what I do. And he let me sing a few songs lead as well because he'd co-written songs like Malibu for, for Hull. So he's like, I want to throw that into the mix and getting to tour all these really famous venues too, like Tower Theatre in Philly and coming back to Nashville and playing the Ryman, which is like the mother church. Like I may not ever get to step onto that stage myself as an artist, but I've kind of already been there. You've been there, yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's very, very cool. But obviously on the road with Smashing Pumpkins, I started being involved with Yamaha because Billy uses all Yamaha acoustics and I started dealing with them and they said, hey, do you want to be involved in this? We like what you do. We we know what you do. And this has been an ongoing relationship ever since. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good. Right, right, that's great. So you have this guitar that you were playing uh, earlier. Can you tell us a little bit about this instrument? Uh, Well, this particular particular one I've been getting into since Gearfest, um, the A3R, and what I like best about it is that it has just the direct pickup in it and also has a pre-sampled, I want to say it's a preset mic input that where they've pre-recorded, I think, through various mics on um, like different Neumanns and different other quality mics and have sampled different A series and you can blend the two between the direct pickup and this particular pickup to get just variations within the guitar. It's, I mean it sounds great whatever you do with it mm-hmm. but the fact that you've got a, a complex range of not just EQ but with the type of sound that you're producing. I, I don't know I've just I'm been really impressed with the sound so far it's really right. great. Nice yeah. nice that's a great sounding instrument. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we were chatting a little bit before the camera started rolling, and we were talking a little bit about your upcoming album. And you've been doing a, a pledge music yeah. campaign for that. And uh, you were talking a little bit about the challenges of commercial versus making music that you feel is lasting and that tells the story. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you're approaching this this project? Well, I think every artist goes through a process of, you know, banging your head against the wall to make a very serious dent, and then you're like, look what I did. Um, but it's one of those situations where you have to look at what you're doing and work out. Am I writing songs for myself? Am I writing for an audience? Who am I writing these songs for? And I've gone through different variations and different, I want to say different personalities as an artist as well. And I've gone from being, you know, extremely pop rock, um, you know, more Sheryl Crowish to my last record being a little bit more Tom Petty, Fleetwood Mac inspired, like very layered guitars and very intricate a kind of a wall of guitars, a wall of mid-range, sure. which is very difficult to replicate live, which I worked out I have to have two lead guitarists as well as me and keyboards, and that's all up the story. But then going back to 
what do I really love as an artist? And working out that I don't have to, I, I don't really have to um, substitute any of the things that I like. I just, I think it's important to show showcase a general sensibility, not, not very too far in your style, but you can always add elements of things that you're interested in. Like for me, I, I love Bowie, I love Dusty Springfield. I love, I mean, I love a variation of artists that, you know, I love a lot of um, soul and Motown as I was talking to you before. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think you have to limit yourself to just doing, well, I just have to do this one thing. And um, what I've learned from talking to my producer a lot is that Bowie even used to go back in the studio and he'd be like, I want the feel of this, but played like this. And he was doing that. So me referencing Bowie is kind of an inception of things. Like it's me referencing him referencing, right. other, you know, <laughs> and on and on and on. Right. But working out that I can take elements of what I like and apply it to the instrumentation that works within the genre that I'm going for. So maybe having a more Bowie-esque melody on a steel instrument or on a slide guitar. So playing with elements, I don't know, just, just still combining the elements that I like. And I think it's been important for me, this particular record that I've been writing is to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite the rewrites. Mm -hmm. I was going through my lyrics and I looked and I found like a particular song I'd written was on version five of these lyrics. And it's one of those things of, I don't want there to be that moment where I listen through a song and I'm like, yeah, but, uh, this one line, you know, lets me down. I want it to be something I can look back in after years and go, this is still great. And this is still timeless. I'm not chasing anything sonically. I'm not chasing anything, anything melodically or lyrically. This is something that I, th I think once I finish this recording process, I'd love it to be in the same sentence. I mean, the goal is, you know, referencing, referencing some Tom Petty, referencing some Ryan Adams referencing some Emmy Lou Harris, referencing some Dusty Springfield and, and some horns, some, you know, maybe some Otis or something, some Stax records for horns, throwing that all into the mix and applying it to these songs. It's been a really complex um, process this time around because I've put way more thought into it than rather than just, let's just record and just whatever. I don't have the luck. It costs so much money to make a quality record and fundraising is one thing. I'm also not at the mercy of a record label. So I'm not at the mercy of a time frame, and I'm not at the mercy of somebody else telling me what to do with my career. If I had some other, somebody else funding things, obviously there'd be more of a schedule and maybe they would have a slot to face it, you know, well, we need it to fit into this genre so it doesn't compete with this artist or this artist or this artist on our label. But I just want to make something and at the end of the day, musicians want to listen to right. and go, that's cool. Or that section where it does that thing, it's so unexpected. Or I haven't heard that since this song or since this album. Or, you know, that's something that Tom Waits did. You know, just I, I want people to sort of be interested and challenged musically and not just be like, four chords. And some songs can be four chords. I'm not knocking the three or four chord songs. Right. But knowing that it can also then swing into a section that ends up being more Beatlesque or something. Like, sure. I've been unafraid as an artist to write those into the songs this time and plan for weirdness. Right, plan for weirdness, I like yeah. that. Like, yeah. So do you have a, a uh, when you go into the studio to record a project like that, do you have a very specific vision of how it's gonna come out on the end? Or do you go in with a basic arrangement and then let the musicians and yourself kind of run with it? It's both of those. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely maybe on both of those. Um, I mean, I have, the arrangements are written out. I'm going to start chipping away at how I want the arrangements to unfold in terms of who I want to do what on what songs. But you are also kind of casting. You're casting the right musician to bring this element and this texture to the, you know, to the actual table, the table. Right. But also like, you know, casting, it's like casting the right guitarist to bring this mood or this knowing like, okay, we want you to play something that's more Lanois or we want you to play something that's more like this. Like knowing what you want them to play so that you know if you've got it. It's not just like play. Right. And I was, I mean, I was a bit picky with guitars on the last record because as I said, it was pretty layered up. Um, but then we kind of went overkill. It was layering and layering rather than this record. I think we're going to approach it more like getting the right part and only having a couple so that they play off each other perfectly. And it's not just, it's not countering with, oh, this part, so we'll just do another layer. We'll just do another overdub. Right. Something that if you play it live, 
can be done mm -hmm. if they can play it. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah, it's a it's a process, but it's I'm I'm excited. I'm really excited in the amount of planning that's gone into it. And again, like yes, there's a lot of headbutting against the wall, but I think it'll be. I've made a solid dent so far. I think I'll right. definitely break through it soon. Well, that's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah, I'm excited. So it's interesting that you've performed on the biggest stages, but you're also doing house concerts. Yeah. Talk a little bit about those two different performing environments and how you take the I songs love, back and forth. I love, love, love house concerts. Yeah? It's something that I think a lot of us artists think, well, you know, it's only 20 or 30 people or whatever, or it's beneath me. Or what. Any fan is a fan and to me, I've made some of the best fans because it feels so personal when you're mm -hmm. in either a large living room or a large outdoor seating area or something like that of someone's house. It's designated. It's a, you know, usually it ends up being like, you know, a set amount of money to, to a tip jar plus, you know, potluck or something. So it becomes a communal sort of event of people and friends and friends of friends. And I, I mean, I, ideally I'd love to do a lot more of them what I do. Um, because they're so much fun. Right. Like there's obviously there's money to be made and people, you know, you can sell merch and interact with people, but people get that one-on-one -on -one experience almost of like when you go, when you, I mean, I know Billy Corgan does them for um, the Smashing Pumpkins things where he does a VIP session where he'll do a few acoustic songs and Q&A mm -hmm. before the main show. And it's kind of that mix of the two worlds where you're right there, you're playing, there's also banter. It's not like you can't hear what that person's saying and you can't just stop a song. And literally, I was playing a show in Indiana in, this was what, last month? Yeah, it was, yeah, last month. And I'm like, what year is it? <laughs> what time is it? Where am I? Um, and I brought a, um, another artist friend up um, from Nashville to play this show because I thought, why well, have one artist when you can have two? It also keeps things like a balance for an audience to not just listen to one artist and be like, oh, this is it. <laughs> Literally, it was kind of a farm-ish. They had chickens and they had some other livestock and literally a chicken escaped during my set and was flapping across the front of where I was performing and the owner was trying to catch this chicken during my, <laughs> my song. And somebody obviously Instagrammed it and videoed it and I, I reposted it. And I was in the middle of the song and I incorporated some lyrics about a chicken into the song because that is a good moment. Mm -hmm. It's real. It's something that... It's, there's nothing stagnant about house concerts at all. Right. There's, it's always something unexpected. It's always a much better time than what you anticipate. And I've played kind of house concerts all over, but I think people I've met there have had a better time than anywhere else. Nice. Yeah. Nice, that's great. Yeah, that's and great. you get to meet people and chat afterwards. And right, it's very yeah. personal. Yeah, I love it. Oh, yeah. That's great, that's great. Well, congratulations on your success in your career. We're excited about the new album, so we'll thank be you. looking for that. And we're glad to have you here at Sweetwater. Thank you. Thank you Hope for you having come me. Come back soon. Thank it's you. Great to see you. Thank you. Cheers. And thank you for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Bless me with a signal. Make it crystal clear. No matter what you're thinking, it won't change how I feel. You probably won't catch me. I'm praying that you will crash landing. I don't not understand it. This is so not like a planet. But I, 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 I'm falling head first down to the earth from the sky. This is a bird. Baby, this child.